Okay, welcome to the continuation of lecture 4.3 of the Domain Specific Languages of Mathematics course. Uh, it's still parts of week and chapter 4 of the book, Compos and uh, this is chapter is about compositionality and algebras. And this uh, code wise continues from lecture 3.3 .3 about numeric classes, where I was talking about the additive and multiplicative instances in the context of functional expressions. Um, so first I some, want to make some notes about the module header. So I got some student questions about these magic incantations needed to convince Haskell of certain extensions that are used. And I've often just hidden the module header. So for example here, the module uh, uh, header is not visible because I've put some information text below the header. So let's go up and make the reveal of what is actually up here. So I have three commented out language extensions which will be needed when I introduce some of the parts below. And they're about instances for type synonyms, flexible instances and constraint kinds, which is a bit optional. So I will talk about them when I run into them, when I run into the error messages that require them to be added. Um, and then comes the module uh, name itself, live43, that's the module name, and it's also the same as the file name, live43.lhs or .hs. And then as I'm redefining some very core things from Haskell here, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and so on, I actually am better off hiding the prelude instead of making up my own names. I'm saying those things defined in the prelude which I want to redefine, I, I hide so that there are no clashes. Still, I want to be able to access them. So I import qualified the prelude. That means that I can write prelude.plus or prelude.negate and so on to get hold of those definitions, even though they are not in scope without the prelude prefix. Okay, and then this is the, the the type synonym I'm very often defining. So I'm sort of simulating real numbers through the type class of floating point numbers of double precision. And that is the course of one of these language extensions as we will see soon. Okay, so that's what the header looks like right now. And I will try to split the screen so that we can get back here reasonably easier, easy uh, later on. Let's put it like that. Okay. So that was some notes and which will continue later. Uh, then a reminder about the type classes additive and multiplicative. So we implemented additive, the type classes additive and multiplicative uh, last week. And uh, the common underlying structure here is that of a mo monoid. So a monoid in mathematics is often described as a triple. A triple, not a Haskell sense triple, but a, a three things. The first A is a, a set in mathematics or often type in Haskell. And then we got an operator and an element. Op is, takes two elements of that uh, set and returns one element. And it should be associative. And it should also have this E as a unit. And having E as a unit means that op E X is the same as X, which is the same as op X E. So if you put E in as the argument, first or second argument to op, the, sec the other component left is basically the identity function. Okay, so we have, we have two classes for this, one called additive and one called multiplicative, uh, just because it's otherwise a little bit difficult to get the, the Haskell modeling to be nice. Um, here I've also added an infix declaration for plus, I will later add the one for minus as well, and an infix declaration for multiplication. And the reason for this is if I don't tell Haskell how the priorities and fixities of these operators are, it will not know. So it will default to something which will probably be wrong. So this is when you write expressions involving more than one operator, then it becomes unclear in which order you should parenthesize them. So this is saying that star, I mean, multiplication sign binds stronger. So that when you write, for example, one 
plus 2 times 3, it should be interpreted as 1 plus 2 times 3. Binds, or binds stronger means that this is sort of implicitly in parentheses. And it's not the same as 1 plus 2 times 3. But if I would switch these uh, precedence levels, the 7 and the 6, then this late last reading would uh, happen with other infix declarations. Okay, so we have the class additive and I here sort of reuse the name plus from the Haskell prelude where there is another type class where addition is in which is matched up with other things. So here I say plus should have a to a to a and zero should be an a. So this is example of a monoid. I can put that as a comment here. It is basically monoid uh, a. Basically the same as monoid a. But I want to keep them apart because I want to have one monoid where I have addition and another monoid where I have multiplication. And I can't keep um, that kind of division here in, in the Haskell file. Okay, so now let's uncomment this line. So I want real to be an additive, so be in the class additive, and addition here should be the predefined addition for real numbers, and zero should be the zero. So if I load this, and now let's drop the logo part, then it complains. It's an illegal instance declaration, additive real. Uh, use type synonym instances if you want to disable this. So I think it's quite reasonable to allow type synonyms in instances, even though, of course, it is a bit difficult perhaps to see what is actually happening. So notice I went up here and I uncommented the language pragma to turn on the type synonym instances. So let's load this again. And now it doesn't complain. Okay, good. Then I can also uncomment the corresponding instance for the multiplicative class, which just uses multiplication from the prelude and one from the prelude. Okay, and now we can uh, express, well, not only express, we can evaluate two, the amazing functional program two, which evaluates to 2.0 in double. Well, not very impressive at this stage, but you can also do interesting stuff with it later. Um, I should mention here that has been hiding so much from the prelude. Um, I define two instead of using the literal two, because if I write two here, uh, well, actually, if I write two plus two here, um, it will use, um, let's see, we'll ask what the type of it is. It will say that this is additive, it requires additive and num. And num here is the type class num from the Haskell prelude which is the one I'm trying to replace by additive and multiplicative and so on. So it becomes a little bit of a mix up to have both num and additive. And that's why I define two here as only using additive and multiplicative and not num. That's perhaps a detail, but it could be relevant for error messages you get when trying to implement uh, the project in the, at the end of chapter four, assignment two. Okay, so this was about real, uh, the two classes and instances for real, and then the next step is function instances. So let's uh, scroll this up a bit. So if b is additive, then we can also make functions returning b is additive, and the same for multiplicative. So a is completely free in this type, uh, in this instance declaration, meaning that we can have functions from string or bool or whatever. And here we got the helper definitions, add f, 0f, and mal f, and 1f, which I've given down here. So add additive and multiplicative units, 0f and 1f, are just const and then the unit of the underlying type. So notice that 0 here, I couldn't write just 0, because that would be, uh, well, in the num class, and it wouldn't be in the additive. So if I write 0 instead, then I get this behavior that whatever the instance is used on the 
base level, I will now use on the function level, similarly with one. And add f and mal f have these definitions, which are uh, using the addition from the additive class on b's to define addition on functions returning b's, same as multiplication. Okay, and now I can, if I write, say, two, and I want it to have type real to real, then I can apply it to say five. So now two is also not only a value of type real, it can also be treated as a function from real to real, or by, for that matter, a function from bool to real and apply it to true. It's a rather boring function though, because it's always a constant function. So for a motivating example, we got this Pythagorean identity that sine square plus cosine square is one. And if we implement something very similar to that, so sine type sine plus cosine times cosine, then we got a function called Pythagorean that we can apply to say three, five, one, zero, and so on. And as you see, we get something very close, but not necessarily exactly equal to one all the time. And the fun thing here is that we're really working with functions. So this is sine function times the sine function plus the cosine times the cosine. And of course, we could also write things like sine plus cosine and so on. And uh, if you look at the type signature here, it says we need additive because of our plus. And then we have still a prelude type class we haven't replaced, which is called floating. And that's the type class which it, which has the methods sine and cosine. Okay, but then it is a function from A to A, which if we apply it to say zero, then it would be sine zero, which is zero, plus cosine zero, which is one. Okay. Um, that was the first part of this uh, Live coding. The next is the definition of some more type classes add group, ring, mal group, and field. So, first, corresponding to the, the additive and multiplicative monoids, we had the, the general concept of monoid. And similarly, here we move into the general uh, algebraic structure of groups. So, a group is a monoid with an inverse. So, we make one class add group for the additive monoid with inverse, and another class, mal group, for the multiplicative monoid with inverse. So I just written a sort of an empty header here for the class add group, uh, just to make sure that some of the code below type checks, but this is not the correct header, because the class add group should really be an additive monoid with inverse. So it should require additive in addition to so, so an add group requires additive as a superclass, and then it also has a method which is the additive inverse, which is called negate here. Okay, so now I can write things like uh, negate two. Okay, no instance for add group, it says. Yeah, that's good. Good reminder that we now have a type class here, but we haven't produced an instance. So instance add group real where negate, oops, negate equal, and I just defer to the preludes negate function here. Ag group, that's not quite right. Add group. Okay, now we can try negating the wonderful number two, or we can negate the Pythagorean. Um, okay, and then if I want to negate Pythagorean, I need also an instance for add group for functions. Okay, good, let's, inst let's add it. So instance, if I know that some type B is an add group, then I can also make functions returning B. Uh, instance of add group and negate here has then to be negate well 
I have named it a sub, uh, postfix f before, so let's do the same here. So negate f, let's see, what type should it have? Well, it should require that the type v be an add group, and then it should work, it should have the type a to a, where a is actually a arrow b. So it should work on functions. And negate f given a function f, it should return a function which applies negate. So this is not a prelude negate, it's the add group negate of the type b. This should apply negate after applying the function. Okay, and now can we do negate Pythagorean? Well, okay, we got the function from real to real, so negate Pythagorean applied 4. Okay, so it's y minus 1. Good. Okay, we have uh, added uh, the additive group class, so that to do has been done. Oh, note quite, it said here define the class add group plus subtraction. Good point. So we let's um, define subtraction here. So what is subtraction? Well, if we have an additive group A, then we should be able to make a binary operator. So x minus y equals. And then this question, how do we define a binary minus? Well, it's just an addition where the second component has switched sign. So this is x plus, well, I don't need parentheses here actually, plus negate y. Okay, so now suddenly I have a minus and to avoid confusion with uh, precedence, I will go up and uh, uncomment the infix declaration. So remember, I had a fixity declaration for addition, and now when I have minus defined, I can make a similar fixity declaration for minus. And that means I can write things like 1 minus 2, or 1 minus 2 times 3, and it will know that the 2 times 3 should be computed before the minus. I can just illustrate here, if I would have 8, so this minus would bind stronger, and then reload, then the same expression 1 minus 2 times 3 will then be first compute 1 minus 2, which is minus 1, and then multiply it by 3. So I better change this back quickly before I get very confused. Okay, so the definition of minus down here was the, the last addition um, of the step from the additive to the additive group class. And then we can do a very similar transition for the class mal group. So the class mal group then requires multiplicative. And uh, it adds a function called recip. It's the same kind of thing as negate, but for multiplication, reciprocal, so one over. So Similarly here, we want a multi multiplicative group. So the real numbers, they have all of these uh, methods. So the recip here is actually the prelude dot recip. Okay, and now we should be able to, well, compute recip of two. Well, impressive, not much, but uh, let's move on. Let's also do variant of the instance for functions. So if we replace add by mal there in two places and then we replace uh, negate by recip. Okay, now it jumped too far down. Then of course we also need to implement and it it is pretty similar to this definition. So we want to implement reciprocal, which requires multiplicative group um, for B, and then it should have the same type as the negate, 
and it should call recip on the result of f. Okay, so now it means that I should be able to make sort of the reciprocal of uh, the Pythagorean, for example. And, well, that's a function. If I apply it to 3, well, it's 1 over the Pythagorean of 3, which is very close to 1. So if we move, remove the 1 over, then it's, yeah, it's slightly below 1 and slightly above 1 due to rounding errors. Okay, um, so now we had this, the to-do was saying introduce the class model group plus division plus instances. I've done the class and instances, now let's do division. So very similar to the subtraction here, I'm defining division and let's also go to the instance, the infix declaration and add that one, infix l. Okay, this was a bit overkill. Um, so I want to define x divided by y as x multiply the reciprocal of y. So remember that the, the idea of the reciprocal here is that it should be the opposite of multiplication. So um, if I take, it's 1 over, it's a, then this becomes a, a way of implementing it. So let's see what it complains about here could not deduce mal group. Yes, it's good, a task will keep me straight here. So remember I co copied the code from minus, but here I need mal group instead. And if I try to check that, yes, that's fine. So notice I don't have to say both multiplicative and mal group because I've already required in the class mal group that it has multiplicative as a superclass. Okay. So this was the second to do for this code block. So then we're done with part two. We've defined um, the add group and the mal group classes and there are two instances for reals and functions. And let's then look at the combinations. So a very common combination is to have an additive group and a multiplicative operations. And uh, this is called a ring. Um, similarly, if we add also a mal group, so we, we also have definition uh, division, then we get a field. But let's start with a ring. And this definition here, class add group A, multiplicative A implies ring, without any where clause, is saying um, any, so, yeah, well, what, what it's trying to say that's the, is that any, um, Thing which we have instances for add group and multiplicative, we should also have an instance for ring without adding any new method. So if we check what we've got here, what is ring, then it say, okay, type class ring is something where if we have add group and multiplicative, then we should have ring, but it doesn't say anything about instances. So let's try to use this. Let's uh, make a definition, test ring, it should say ring A to A, where test ring, say it's using 2 um, plus 2 plus 2, something anyway. Now, I actually, let's, let's use negate as well. Um, to, well, this is going to be a boring one, so 2 minus 2, so it's basically 0. Okay, so I want to evaluate my test R. And it says no instance for ring. So this is a little bit annoying. So I've I provided instance declarations for add group and multiplicative for real numbers and functions, and still the class ring I've introduced here does not have any instances. So of course it's not difficult to add an instance declaration here, uh, but I will choose to go another route instead. So I will comment out this one and write something which is basically the same. And now it will complain. So this is trying to, to give a type synonym saying that ring of A is actually this. But type synonyms um, are not allowed to uh, have be sort of class synonyms in 
standard Haskell. So now it complains. If I load it here, we can see the error messages. Illegal constraint synonym of kind constraint. Use constraint kinds to permit this. So I will allow this kind of construct to be used uh, by adding that, that extension. And now it says, OK, fine. And now I can try again my test R. And now it evaluates R. And if I check the information about test R, it says, no, sorry, my information about ring, then it will say, well, this just is type synonym, which is constraints. And being a type synonym means that it expands to add group A, multiplicative A, and those have instances. So it's a slight difference but it's a practical convenience that when I define uh, basically the same thing in this way, then I don't have to provide sort of empty instance declarations to fill in this one. So let's just keep that out of the class. Uh, that means instead of doing this form for the class declaration, I will also comment that one out and instead use the type synonym for fields also in this way. So now I can do things like 2 divided by 2 and compute. Well, I can also do Pythagorean divided by 2. And then that will be a real-to-real -real function, which I can apply to, say, 5. So it's basically 1 half. OK, so now I introduced uh, this thing called a ring. And let's just try to sum up and explain what homomorphisms are in this context. First, a reminder, I have these three predicates, H2, H1, and H0, for homomorphisms of pure operators. So just an operator op A and an op B. So move, if H translates from the A world to the B world, uh, the property H2 is saying that it transforms an A operator to a B operator in the sense that if we apply the A operator first and then H, it's the same as first applying H and then the B operator. Similarly for H1 and H0. And using these, we have seen that we can combine them to structural homomorphisms. So the monoid homomorphism so this is a, a line packed with content. So a monoid homomorphism is a predicate relating age to a monoid on A and a monoid on B. And that's defined, maybe I should say age def uh, here. It's defined to be age two of the same age and age zero of the same age of these operators, op A and EA. So that's a monoid homomorphism. And then the ring homomorphism is basically the same then for rings. So a ring can be described as something having five operations. So it's a set, A, and then an addition on A, a zero on A, negate on A, multiplication on A, and a one on A. So I put them in this order because the addition and zero together is a monoid and negate uh, makes it an additive group and then multiplication and one uh, makes that part of multiplicative group. Okay, so the the arguments to the predicate ring home doesn't end here. So this is the second argument to ring home and the third argument is something of the exactly the same shape. So we set B, addition, zero, negate, multiplication and one for another type B. And then this is the defined to be, and then are three lines. And as I mentioned, we see this as a, a monoid homomorphism from A to B on the addi additive structure, a monoid homomorphism on the multiplicative structure, and a, an H1, so a homomorphism of negate. So this is as I mentioned earlier, monoid homomorphism is an H2 and an H0. So what this basically says is that there are five homomorphism conditions, one for each of the five operators. Addition, zero, negate, multiplication, and one. 
But it turns out that the axioms that are expected here also means that it can be simplified to only requiring that H2 be a homomorphism for addition, multiplication, and one. The other two, negate and zero, follow from these three. So sometimes it's convenient to simplify it, to define it, the ring homomorphism to be just this. So we will not talk much about ring homomorphisms, but it's worth knowing about for um, the sort of uh, questions here and there. And it's uh, a concept which is expanded quite a lot in other math courses about rings and polynomials and different structures. Similarly, you can define what a homomorphism is for fields. And basically, the homomorphism for any kind of type class or of this shape will have a, a collection of this H2 and H1 and H0 and so on, usually as the core building blocks, and then require that all operators satisfy this. OK, so uh, to sum up, you may see that we didn't use the flexible instances here, but depending a little bit on what the instances you want to define are, you will run into it. It's the, when you when you make something a little less general than our function instances. So here it's a function instance for any A and any B. If you would like to add an instance for say real add or real, then you would run into that problem. And in some other cases, you might want another language extension as well. But what we've written so far here, doesn't didn't require it. Uh, but we've implemented in addition to the previous additive group and uh, additive additive monoid and multiplicative monoid. Now we also have the additive group called add group, and we have the multiplicative group called mal group, and we have these very common combinations of rings and fields. And rings and fields will be used quite a bit um, in the next weeks so um, that's a good start and um, now I think uh, we'll we can reach the end of this uh, part of the lecture.